Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I am your gaming monk for the evening. A narrative that I often hear about the alleged world's greatest role-playing game is that nobody plays past 10th level, or that the game gets boring and or too easy after 10th level. While I can certainly see the argument, I'd like to delve into not just whether that's true or false, but why people come to that conclusion. I'd say the first thing would be the combination of hit point rate and damage rate. In my opinion, spells notwithstanding, it's skewed for high HP. But the damage doesn't scale at a similar enough rate, or there's not enough danger points beyond just whittling down HP. This is what I said spells notwithstanding for, as they're the most reliable means of dispensing damage that will scale. Of course, that puts spell slots into consideration. Point is, the health to damage scaling goes more and more out the window at higher levels. I think this contributes to the boredom feeling, or in some cases, the narrative that 5e goes superhero with characters. Not helping this matter is the way classes are designed after 10th level. I'm not counting subclasses in this as that's a lot of moving parts, but I think going into the 20th level capstone benefits into each class provides a little pattern for us. So with Barbarian, we have a whole lot of numbers going up. Whoopee. With Bard, I have to ask, why is this a 12th level feature? Oh right, it's because Wizards of the Coast is so afraid of feet bloat that they ran the opposite way as if that'll fix the problem. With the Cleric, it actually feels like a natural improvement. It's one of the rare exceptions here. With the Druid, its capstone would be more impressive if Wild Shape wasn't capped at CR1. With the Fighter, getting three attacks per round is a case of better hope that RNG this is on your side. And I'm reminded of why I kept hacking fighters, even going all the way back to my AD&D days. Multi-attack alone isn't all that impressive. As for the monk, it's all the same problems with the bard's capstone. And once again, I have to ask, why is this a feature and not a feat? The paladin, for whatever reason, the capstone is in their subclass, so it's one of the rare cases that does okay. The Ranger has the worst capstone, and that's before all the attempts to fix. Although the Ranger being snakebitten is a topic for another day. But even so, this is just another case of numbers go up, using an ability that you might not have used all that much because you're a half-caster. And apparently multiple ability dependency is still a thing. As for the Rogue... It's a decent feature that falls within the class fantasy, but it's still based on that short rest, long rest economy that I've never been a fan of. For the sorcerer, it has a similar problem to the bard and monk's capstones, and it still comes off like a feat than a feature. As for the warlock, the ability to get a handful of spells back to be able to cast them again, I'd say that feels like an appropriate cheat. As far as the wizard, two free third level spells. Those are probably going to get used as more fireballs, so you'd think there'd be more freebies by this point. The pattern I keep seeing is that things are better served as a feat, or a case of numbers go up, which, considering the amount of work to get to that level, I find to be unsatisfactory. I'm not opposed to getting some static number increases, but I'd rather that be part of the advancement rather than all of it. Now, I asked my good friend Tanner, creator of Heavens of Heresies, about this conundrum, and here is his take. Quote, so my experience has been, it depends on the group in terms of players and GM. Higher level play requires, in my experience at least, a lot more of the GM. They can no longer use CR as a basis for making encounters. Not that they should have really been using it in the first place. CR as a rubric for challenge tends to not make interesting encounters. CR works better as an indicator amount of stuff a creature can do without help rather than a strict guideline for encounters. From my experience, high-level play just means that the players have more answers to things. So unless a GM is able to think up interesting problems, and I mean interesting because saying you can't use that one specific answer you have isn't interesting, it's just depriving them of something they worked for, the game stagnates. But not all GMs are able to do that, because not all GMs really think like game designers, and that's not necessarily their fault. On the other hand, if the players don't actively use their abilities, or aren't really aware of how to use them to the best of their abilities, then it's a lot less is required of the GM, because even though the party has a multitude of answers, they don't actually know that they have them. For reference, I was a player in an Out of the Abyss campaign, which ended at level 14. 
But we also had six to eight people at the table every night. Public game, the poor GM was assigned people. And I have a decently tactically oriented mind. I knew what every player was capable of and used them to great effect. Which put a lot of strain on the GM, which I didn't realize until afterwards. It was a mistake on my part because I didn't intend to make him work hard for the game. He could no longer use CR or a lot of the guidelines within the DNG or bestiary made to make encounters. It did make him a much better GM, but it wasn't a fun experience, so I should have been a better player, I just didn't know till after. Part of that was due to part size, but a lot of it was due to level. Now I'd think really good GMs can make level 10 plus games interesting, but that's almost a non-point because really good GMs can make most games interesting." End quote. Now for me, I've made clear in the past that I'm no fan of CR as a measuring stick for encounter building. I didn't like it 22 years ago, and my reasoning hasn't changed. For the sake of brevity, my issue is that CR creates too many assumptions about the party composition. The fact that it gets used as a crutch is, in my opinion, a failure of the designers to actually teach people to be dungeon masters and instead rely on previous experience. I also think a fair point is made about not using abilities, but this is a hell of the designer's own making. By using simplicity as their battle cry for years on end, it puts in people's heads that the only abilities they need to utilize are the basic checks on their character sheet. That's not always the case, but I see it happen enough that I can't discount it. It doesn't help that the level of complexity results in Babby's first character being a common trap. Now, when I was doing my research on the current state of World of Warcraft for the Exodus Trilogy episodes on Geek Watch, one pattern I noticed among the raiding side of things was the claim that Blizzard was hyper-focused on the World First guilds, a minority of extremely coordinated high-level guilds who were being catered to to the point that most players would find raiding far too difficult unless every single thing goes right. I think D&D has the opposite problem in the sense that they're hyper-focused on the idea that they need to make it accommodating to new players. I look at this the same way I see boosting in MMOs in the name of getting newcomers to catch up to the new content, or the excessive rebooting done in mainstream comic books in the name of not making continuity impenetrable for new readers, or even the casual appeal of the Nintendo Wii if you want to go that far. Being newbie-friendly isn't a bad thing. But it certainly can become one when you're so focused on bringing in newcomers that you aren't turning newbies into veterans. The current D&D scene wants people to get started, but never finish. I can't help but feel this will bite them like the OGL bubble bursting so long ago. But that's just the take of a gaming monk. Stay frosty.